Hey everyone, it's Chow here, and today we are going to look over some key principles of evolutionary and developmental biology, aka EvoDevo. So let's get started. Okay, so the first thing in regards to principles in EvoDevo is that there's often this consideration of a shared developmental mechanism or mechanisms which ultimately control specific DNA sequences. And so we look at these things called genetic toolkits that is conserved between many different species and many different lineages, but you can often modify or reshuffle them to produce the remarkable diversity that we see today in the natural world. What's really also fascinating is that small changes in the application of that genetic toolkit, such as when, where, and how much genes are expressed, it's going to also influence ultimately the development of the organisms and in addition produce that variation. So changes in the application of the genetic toolkits can actually have stronger effects on the organisms early on in development, whereas later on in development, it might not have as, of, uh, as big of an effect on the phenotype of the organism. So when you think about it from a developmental standpoint, I think it makes sense that if you're making things change early on, you can have a longer lasting impact, whereas if you're making changes later on, you're gonna have less impact. So that's something that's fairly critical for our concept in Evo Devo. And I think uh, in just general developmental biology, that should also make a bit of sense. Okay, so then we move on to the key principle in Evo Devo number two, and that is that duplications of these genes, chromosomes, or even whole genomes ultimately allows for that starting material which mutation can produce a novel variation. So if you think about it, you have one set of genes, maybe some of those genes are very important, but some of them maybe you can tinker with. So if you have one copy of that gene and then you duplicate that gene, or maybe you duplicate that chromosome, or maybe you duplicate that entire genome, you have multiple sets to play with. And ultimately, as long as that original set is there, the novel genes that are produced, you can potentially have mutations that occur, and ultimately maybe beneficial mutations will collect over time. So one of the examples that is quite cool, I think, is the antifreeze gene. And so what's really fascinating about antifreeze genes in species like the ice fish, uh, ice fish, excuse me, ice fish, is that the changes are already present in the system. So you're taking what's already present and simply tinkering with it to make something new. So the original genes are duplicated and one set stayed the same while the other set accumulated mutations that eventually gave it a new function to make antifreeze proteins in the fish's body. And then also there's a secondary thing that's associated with it and that is ice fish don't really have hemoglobin. So they lost hemoglobin due to a previous mutation which eventually wrecked the hemoglobin producing gene. But it wasn't really needed because the fish lives in cold waters and they don't necessarily need hemoglobin in order to survive. So you can see the ice fish blood is almost liquid like water, whereas the blood of a normal fish is kind of like the blood of human. So if the gene ultimately becomes useless, you don't really need to make hemoglobin anymore, it will eventually become lost as the mutations pile up and those mutations aren't selected against. And as those mutations pile up, you ultimately might erase that gene and, and its, its function as a whole. So what's really fascinating, I guess, in terms of the second key principle is that evolution comes up with something useful from what is already available within the body of the organism. It's not creating something new out of thin air, it's just simply taking what's available, altering it, tinkering with it, and then using that tinkering result to potentially benefit the organism in the long run. So that's the second key principle. Okay, and just a brief rundown of some of these terms, we have modularity, which is quite important because that is how mutations of large effect 
basically affect only one small part of the body because everything is modulated into sort of segments. You can think about it that way. And so developmental processes can be localized to certain tissues or different tissues or regions within the embryo. And so if you have mutations, right, that affect only one region, the other regions aren't hindered. And so modularity can have this effect that can ultimately benefit the organism. So again, mutations of large effect might only affect a small part of the body because if it's expressed in a specific manner it's maybe only going to affect like this particular segment of the head rather than affect the entire organism. We can see some of this in certain mutations. For instance, modularity in the misexpression of the UBX gene in our fruit flies, Drosophila, can cause some variations with the result. So normal UBX expression, the, the expression of the ultra bithorax gene in normal fruit flies suppresses, so it's a suppression gene, suppresses the development of the second pair of wings. So you can see in a normal fruit fly, the second pair of wings called the halteres, they're really tiny and they're not really even wings. They're kind of used for balance and I believe maybe directional. Uh, when, when the fly is actually flying, it helps with control of direction, so directional selection in terms of, of, of its flight trajectory, if, if I may. But what's really fascinating here then is that the mis or mutated expression of this UBX gene leads to the development of a second pair of wings. So normal expression suppresses wing development, but mis or mutated expression leads to the development of the second pair of wings. So you can see this mutated fly over here for the gene UBX, it's grown a second pair of wings. And what's really great about this sort of misexpression is that presumably you have some organisms or lineages of organisms that may arise as a result of these mutations. So if you think about dragonflies, they have a wing structure that's very similar to this fly over here. So presumably maybe something like suppression of U, uh, uh, maybe some kind of a mutation in UBX which led to the suppression of, of wing development to fail ultimately created a some kind of an insect with two pairs of wings instead of just one pair of wings and that potentially led to the evolution of a new lineage of insects like dragonflies or, da uh, or damselflies. So that's why modularity is quite key in terms of evolutionary and developmental biology.